I was once very strongly convicted by an observation that another preacher made. He said, most pastors, when they get to the passages in the Bible that are about healing, they teach on everything you could possibly imagine except healing. They take the passage on Naaman being healed or the blind man receiving his sight or you name the story and it becomes spiritualized and applied to other areas of life other than the literal healing of the body. Now, I believe that it is appropriate to preach the word that way, but I was rather strongly convicted by that. And I thought to myself, I've taught through the whole book of Luke. Did I do that? Did I actually talk about the thing that Jesus was doing? So I always try to make sure that when we come across these passages, while there will be other ways to apply it, and God gives us truth that is so layered and so deep you can dive into it and never hit the bottom, that we need to actually talk about what he's talking about. And tonight we're going to talk about healing, the healing of the body. And I don't mean this in any kind of cute sense, where healing meaning I got over it, <laughs> or healing meaning I'm okay with it now, or mental healing. I, all those things can apply, but I'm talking about miraculous medical healing of the body. And I would say most Christians' theology of healing that they have, at least in the tradition in which we run, most Christians are very familiar with the lesson we learned from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, where Paul is told by the Lord, I'm not going to heal you, Paul. My grace is sufficient for you. And the lesson of that is a very important one to add to our, our comprehensive theology of miracles and healing, which is there are indeed times where the Lord says, no, I'm not going to heal you, and we should be content that we are saved and that the grace of the Lord has covered our soul. I would say most Christians are very familiar with that teaching. To the neglect of the preponderance of other things the Bible teaches on this, which is to have a real, miraculous faith. I say this as kindly as I can, but that line of thinking, which is a legitimate biblical point that we need to understand and was included by the Holy Spirit for a reason, but it can be used by certain people as a theological permission to embrace a naturalistic worldview when it comes to miracles and healing. We live in a culture that doesn't really believe in miracles, doesn't really believe in healing, doesn't believe that God intervenes in the world. And when you get to something like healing and miracles, well, that's really where the rubber meets the road, and it's either you know, paint or get off the ladder when it comes to your faith in Christ. So many of us uh, heave a sigh of relief when we come across that passage and others like it because we think, okay, so I don't really need to insist and wait on the healing. I can, I can say, well, you know, God must have just said no. And it gives us permission to live just like the rest of the world. And I say that because I myself have been in that category before. There are two issues that come up that are going to be addressed by this passage as relates to the doctrine of healing. And they both start with D so that you can remember them. <laughs> Number one, we doubt. And what specifically do we doubt? Not God's power. We all believe that God is powerful and able. I'm talking about faith-filled, born-again believers now. But we doubt God's willingness to heal me today. I believe God can. I just don't know if he wants to. And that leads us to couch our prayers in way more, and if you don't, sentences, then we probably should. Because we're trying to make sure we give God an out. Because we have been trained that you need to make sure that it's, if it's not God's will, then don't you dare ask for it. And so it becomes a game of trying to discern, is this really what God wants? And if it's not, I don't want to ask for it. And it becomes a doubt of God's willingness. And number two, the other D, is that we are discouraged. We've done this before. They've anointed me with oil before. They've laid hands on me before. I've had big cathartic moments where I was weeping before God before, and I just can't go through that again. Doubt and discouragement. Those things are real, and we're going to address them. However, you cannot get away from the fact that God has very clearly commanded us by his prophets and apostles to pray and ask for the healing of the body. And not only to ask, to ask but to expect a positive answer. You know, believe me, James chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. If there ever was a curmudgeon of the New Testament, it was James the apostle, the brother of Jesus. 
You read through that. Faith without works is dead. We can tame every kind of animal, but you can't tame the tongue. Not many of you should become teachers. Weep and hail, you wail, you, you rich people that are about to lose all your money in the judgment. He gets to chapter 5 and he writes this. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Now I'm going to read this last verse in the King James, if you don't mind. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It has great power as it is working. What we often lack, as this passage is going to teach us tonight, in the midst of our doubt and our discouragement, what we lack is persistence. Persistence. The willingness to keep asking rather than resolve ourselves to what has happened and come to terms with our situation. In these two stories, we're first going to see Jesus deal with a woman who had absolutely no right to ask for his healing power. And then we're going to see him heal another man through a rather long and rather unusual process, even for Jesus. And tonight, I'm praying that we can exchange our doubts and our discouragement for persistence in prayer for healing. We begin at verse 24, going down to verse 30. And from there, Jesus arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit, she was possessed, heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this statement you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. All right, let's orient ourselves here. It says, From there, the last location that Mark gave us in this book was Gennesaret, which was on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. But we also had a story in between that where he was confronted by the Pharisees about washing of hands. You remember that? And so it could have been that he was back in Capernaum, but wherever he was from, he decided to leave there and go north. Go north into what is modern-day Lebanon, but back then was the region of Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon were two very prominent, powerful cities on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. And they had existed for a very long time with a lot of power. These are Phoenician cities. If you're familiar with your ancient history, Carthage was a Phoenician city. If you know about Rome and Carthage and the Punic Wars, these were Phoenicians. And the Phoenicians were a seafaring people. They were, they were mariners on their boats. And they had a trade empire that went from England, what we call today England, Britannia, it was known as then. They were also, we believe, the first people to circumnavigate Africa from the south to try and find a faster route to get to some of the places that they would deliver their goods to. They were very, very wealthy. They were very powerful. They were very skilled. Our alphabet is the Phoenician alphabet. They were the first ones to invent that writing. It's, it's a pretty significant thing to invent the alphabet, wouldn't you say? And if you read through the Old Testament, they're all over the place. Tyre and Sidon are all over the place. The man who was the king of Tyre named Hiram was the one who supplied Solomon with the materials with which he built the temple. And it said that Hiram loved David. There was a unity and an alliance between Tyre and the, the land of Israel that continued in a very negative way when the princess of Sidon married the king of Israel. And her name was Jezebel. And Jezebel was married to Ahab, who persecuted the prophets, introduced the worship of Baal to the land of Israel. Her daughter, Athaliah, married the, the son of the king of Judah. And Athaliah ended up assassinating her entire married family so that 
this land could eventually be unified and probably brought under the authority of the Tyrians and the Sidonians. This is a Gentile territory. If you read through the books of Ezekiel, especially, and the other prophets, there are a lot of oracles directed against Tyre and Sidon, mostly for their pride, because they thought nobody could ever come against us. And there was a prophecy given by the Old Testament that said, there's going to come one that is going to smash Tyre into pieces and conquer it. And the problem was, Tyre was such a, a mercantile city. It was such an economically powerful city. You didn't want to destroy it. You wanted to bring it onto your team. You wanted to make an alliance with Tyre. Well, when Alexander the Great showed up, what they did is they withdrew to an island fortress they had just off the coast that was said to be impenetrable. And what they would do, if an enemy came through, they'd withdraw to the tower and they'd say, you're never getting us out of here. Let's make a deal. Well, Alexander the Great had a different plan. He destroyed the city of Tyre piece by piece and used the rubble to build a causeway out to the, to the fortress on the island and conquered it. That's why they called him Alexander the Great, among other things. But nobody thought Tyre could be conquered. They had certainly diminished in their importance by now, but it's, it's important to know this, because if you're reading the Old Testament and you come to the book of Mark, this is significant. Tyre and Sidon, Gentiles. Many of our prophecies about the devil, he's compared to the king of Tyre. And so here goes Jesus into this Gentile territory. What's he doing here? Well, he's trying to get a break. <laughs> Remember, we've been tracking this for a while. Jesus has been trying to get a chance to take a rest with his disciples from the ministry because it was wearing them down. They didn't have time to eat, it said at one point. And Jesus was not even getting a chance to preach the word because there were so many needs of healing and other miracles that were needed. But it says he could not be hidden. Even up in Tyre and Sidon, they knew who he was. And he's approached by this one woman, this desperate woman who has a, a possessed little girl at home. A demon has gotten hold of her daughter. And she knows that Jesus can cast out demons. And she comes begging Jesus to cast the demon out. It says she was a Syrophoenician. That's the combination of the word Phoenician, which I just described, and Syro, which is like Syria, because it was the Phoenician cities up in the region of Syria. There was another kind of Phoenicians known as Libyophoenicians, which are in the modern day country of Libya. Carthage was a Libyophoenician city before it was destroyed. Now, when this desperate woman approaches Jesus, you might think you know how it's going to go. Jesus heals everybody that came to him. The Bible says it over and over again. But Jesus told this woman, no. Jesus declined to help a Gentile. The Gospel of Matthew in chapter 15 gives the parallel story and it adds a few more details for us. It tells us that Jesus explicitly said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Why is he not helping this woman? Because she was a Gentile. And because he was in the land of the Gentiles and he had not been sent to the Gentiles but to Israel. And Jesus says this phrase, it's not good to take the bread that was meant for the children and give it to the dogs. Now, this is not a nice thing to say. There's two ways to approach this. First of all, is we want to try to spin it in such a way so that Jesus wasn't really meaning that mean when he said it. And, well, when he said dog, he meant puppies. But okay, it's still not a nice thing to call somebody. The, the Jews refer to Gentiles as dogs. So it's a common thing. But I, in any case, however strongly he meant it, his whole point is, if I took the kid's food and gave it to my dog, I have a dog named Silas. If I made, you know, barbecue and I said, all right, kids, here comes the brisket. And I set it down on the floor and gave it to Silas. They, they might have something to say about that. <laughs> that's not a nice thing to do. And that's what he says it would be like if he were to begin ministering to the Gentiles in their land rather than to the Jews in their land. And this is important to know. This, this is an important theological principle. Jesus Christ was, in fact, the Jewish Messiah. He was sent to the land of Israel. And we must never forget that. Even Paul will say that the gospel is for the Jew first. And also for the Greek. Also for the Gentiles. We're not excluded if you're a Gentile. But it's for the Jews first. There's a whole Old Testament that explains why that is. You read Psalm chapter 2, which is a messianic psalm. It talks about one of the things Messiah would do when the king, when the son of David finally comes, is he will strike down the nations the goyim, the Gentiles, and rule them with a rod of iron. He'll shatter them into pieces. So that is, in fact, part of why Jesus had come. So Jesus was not making something up here. The disciples and even the Pharisees would have nodded along at this. That's right. It's not for you. 
However, knowing the character of Jesus as we do, it's at first surprising that Jesus would say no to anybody, isn't it? Is that okay? Is this, is this messing up the entire Bible? <laughs> it's kind of blowing my mind right now that Jesus would say that to somebody, call this lady a dog and tell her, no, it's not for you. I don't heal Gentiles. That sounds kind of like racist for Jesus to say that. Would Jesus do something like that? Well, he did. But however, we know Jesus so well. So it is no surprise to us that he did, in fact, heal this woman's daughter, is it? It's not a surprise. We kind of know where this was going to go. He says, lady, and I don't know what his tone would have been like here. I imagine this is more of a, I mean, stern. Jesus was a strong person, right? Strong personality. But it's also, I would imagine there's some compassion here. He's like, look, I'm not here to do ministry to the Gentiles. That time is going to come, but it's not now. Yeah, I can't take the, the, do- the kids' breads and give it to the dogs. And this lady was quick-witted. She was sharp. Yeah, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall off the table, right? And I, I imagine Jesus laughing at that point. Like, oh, I like this one. Jesus has a thing for a good turn of phrase, doesn't he? You read through the Bible. He does. He's, he's very, I remember we read through this with our youth group one time, and I said, what stood out to you? We had the whole Gospel of Mark in one night. So what stood out to you about Jesus? I remember Jared, our, our, one of our guys that was so faithful to that group, he goes, I just, I never realized how clever Jesus was. That people would say something, he would just turn it right back around on him. And so Jesus now says something to this woman, and it gets turned right back around on him. And not only is it turning it back on him, it's an expression of great, profound faith. Those are Jesus' two favorite things. <laughs> like, oh, all right. For that, because you said that, all right. Your, daughter's, your daughter is well. And go on home. He extended mercy to a desperate woman, even though it wasn't her time, and she had no right to ask for it. And we go, that's the Jesus I know. And this is, in fact, what the Messiah was also come to do. Isaiah 49, verse 6, the Lord, speaking to his Messiah prophetically, says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations, or Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. So, The Lord says to his Messiah in that passage, you are so great and so awesome and so wonderful. It would be too little just for you to be the savior of the Jews. You're also going to save all the Gentiles and all the nations all around the world. And this is what Jesus is doing. The time will come in the book of Acts where the gospel will go out to every nation and every creature. It was not that time yet, but even this woman is able to eat the crumbs off the table, so to speak. Here's the point I want to make from this story. We hear that, of this woman coming and asking Jesus for help. And Jesus says, no, no, it's not for you. And it got a little tense in here. (laughs) Is this okay for Jesus to say, I can't imagine Jesus ever telling anybody, no, I'm not going to help you. I'm not going to to heal your daughter. I mean, what, what kind of Messiah do you call that? Well, let me say it like this. The church today is filled with people who do not see themselves as the sons and daughters of God, but as the dogs that have to scrounge for scraps from the table of the Lord. We read Jesus saying this out loud to a person, and it shocks us. Why? Because we know what Jesus is like. And yet, when it comes to our own lives and the things that we ask for from the Lord, we take it very easily that the Lord says all the time, well, I don't want to do that for you. You're not my child to ask things of me. Every now and then you may catch a crumb from my table, but I'm not going just to give this to you. And we think that the Lord would treat us in the manner which shocked us when he treated somebody else in Scripture. I meet so many people. We've seen so many amazing miracles in this church, and I love to talk about them everywhere I go. And what I have found in that time, most people believe in God's healing power. They believe it like they believe in the resurrection and the virgin birth and the inerrancy of Scripture, that God has the power to save and to heal. Yet they doubt, or first D, they doubt God's willingness to heal. Jesus could have healed this woman's daughter, but initially he was not willing. And that's how we tend to think about our relationship to the Lord in these matters. But when we read this story, we're we're shocked at the thought of Jesus refusing to help someone just because they're on the outside of the family of God. That doesn't seem right. That doesn't seem fair. That doesn't sound like Jesus. And yet, here are we on the inside. We are the family of God. We are the sons and daughters of God. And yet, we take it as a common thing that Jesus is not willing to help us. 
I know he can. I just don't think he wants to. Is that how this Syrophoenician woman acted? I know he can heal, but I doubt he'd want to heal a Gentile girl. What would you say to her if she said that to you? No, go ask him. He's a merciful, wonderful, kind Savior. Go ask anyway. And yet, we have way more access to Jesus than this woman did. Romans 8, verses 14 through 17. Let me tell you about who you are in Christ. All who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. We're not the dogs. We're the children of God. And if children, then heirs. Do you know what an heir is? The person that is going to receive everything when the king dies. So we are heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. If you're a Christian, you are a son or a daughter of God. And when it comes to your relationship to ask and receive from Almighty God, you are not even as this Gentile woman whom Jesus compared to a dog hanging out around the table and who still got blessed, by the way. You're one of the children sitting at the table. That's who you are. And with all due consideration to divine wisdom and 2 Corinthians 12 and everything, how ought we to expect God to treat his kids? Consider that. If we have been called the children of God, how ought we to expect him to treat his kids? Now we could maybe mull that over and come up with some answers, but the Bible's already answered us for us. The apostles instructed us to pray for healing and to expect it because God is not a manipulative father that makes promises to you and then when it comes time to pay up, says, ah, never mind, kid. He's a good father. What is the character of Christ? Just think about that. It's self-sacrificial love. That's why we're saved, is that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, out of his love for us. Which means the attitude you and I ought to have when we come to God is not, well, I don't know if he wants to. It's, of course he'll want to. It's Jesus. It's my beloved Jesus. It's the one that was willing to go outside of the messianic mission to help a desperate woman. Of course he would. Rather than doubts based on our own despair, which we'll get to in a minute. We ought to come with an expectation of an answer from the Lord. And I'm talking about an answer for healing from the Lord. What we lack is persistence. Persistence. I'm going to keep on asking. Read the Gospel of Matthew. It's actually a little longer in that section. This woman would not be put off. She kept coming to the point where the disciples were annoyed and said, Jesus, will you please send this woman away? She was bugging them. She was following them. She was calling out to them. Jesus was trying to give the silent treatment so that she'd take a hint and go away. She would not leave them alone. She was assailing heaven for an answer, knocking on the door. I know you're in there. If the Lord tells you no, woman, you best go away. She goes, uh, my daughter's possessed. Excuse me. I'm coming. Jesus himself in Luke chapter 18 taught us that we ought always to pray and never give up. It's a parable. I'm not going to read the actual parable. I'm just going to read the, the beginning and then the end, ending where Jesus explains the purpose. He told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He says, will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Will they have enough faith to cry to me day and night? Will they have enough persistence to keep knocking and keep asking even when it seems like they've been rebuffed time and again? What's the lesson? The heart of God is to heal you. Jesus loves you. And you are not in sin when you keep asking for God's help. 
I'm going to liberate somebody right now. You are not offending God when you keep asking for God to help you. Jesus told us, don't stop asking. This Syrophoenician woman, outside of the covenant, was given her breakthrough because she kept asking even when she didn't deserve it. How much more you, a son or a daughter, who is inside of the new and better covenant, receive what the Lord asks, Lord promised to you. Verse 31, we'll continue now. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. Check this out. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, first unusual thing, not the last, he put his fingers into his ears, and after spitting, touched his tongue, and looked up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that's the Aramaic for be opened. And his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. So Jesus is taking a northwestern arc around Galilee. Sidon is north of Tyre. And he's coming back around down south to the Decapolis. He's been in this region before. This is the southeast of the Sea of Galilee. It included Decapolis, which means ten cities. Deca is like ten. Polis is like city. And included some Jewish and also some Gentile cities. It was largely known as a Gentile area. So this is interesting. We just came out of the beginning of chapter 7, which is all about that which is outside a man does not defile him, but what is inside of him. And the next section we have is Jesus doing ministry to Gentiles. So that's pretty significant, isn't it? And everywhere Jesus went, many were brought for healing. John said that if I were to tell you everything that Jesus did, the whole world does not have enough books to contain all the stories. So they choose, they choose the, the humdingers. <laughs> My old geometry teacher used to say that whenever there was a hard question. He says, here's 10 questions and they got one humdinger in there for you. Well, they choose the good ones. And this is certainly an interesting one. You have a deaf man. And, and literally in Greek there, it's a compound word where it says, and he had hard speech, difficult speech. It was unable to speak in some way. Now, uh, there's a couple ways of, of figuring out what that might have meant. It could be that he had lost his hearing and so he was learning to speak but was hardly able to be understood, which is common even to this day. And imagine that without all the resources that are now available. Or it could be that he was deaf and also there was some deformity with his tongue that didn't even allow him to be understood in that way. So no hearing, no speaking. Very difficult life for this one. And it says they begged him to lay hands on this guy. Apparently, this was the guy, if you're going to touch one person, you've got to get this guy. And this is a rather unusual story of healing in the New Testament. Most people, Jesus has says, laid his hands on them, or it just says he spoke and they were healed. We even have examples of Jesus healing from a distance. By the way, did you know every story in the New Testament of Jesus healing from a distance is when he's healing a Gentile? I don't know if that means anything. It's just interesting to know. Although Jesus did have a few unusual methods, in John chapter 9, he healed a blind man by spitting in the mud, making mud, and then rubbing the mud in the guy's eyes. And said, now go wash it off. That almost sounds like he's bullying the man, doesn't it? Now go clean yourself up. But guess what? He washed off the mud, and when he washed off the mud, he could see. In Mark chapter 8, we're going to see this in a little bit here, uh, Jesus spit in the guy's eyes. And this is probably the strangest one about Jesus. There are others that are called unusual. In the book of Acts, Peter's shadow healed a couple people. Paul's sweat bands were being laid on people and they would be healed or a demon would come out of them. There's some unusual miracles. But check this one out. First of all, it's private. I don't know that we have an example of Jesus doing this other than uh, the young girl who was raised uh, from the dead. Remember, Jairus' daughter. And he takes him aside from the crowd. First, he puts his fingers in his ears, which... Hey, it says Jesus laid hands on people. Maybe there was some variety to that, not just the way that we tend to do it. Maybe it was a little more involved than we're used to. Um, it also says he touched his tongue, which that's also laying hands on somebody. I've never laid hands on someone's tongue before. And then it says Jesus spit. 
Now, there's three options on how this is to be understood. Number one, Jesus spit on the ground and then touched the man's tongue. Number two, Jesus spit on his hand and then touched the man's tongue. Or number three, Jesus spit on the man's tongue. They're all rather strange to our ears. I'm inclined to think it was the second option. We also see Jesus sighing. It's not something you see Jesus doing very often. Sighing. Almost as though there, there's a labor in prayer going on here. Sighing and groaning before the Lord. And it doesn't say Jesus did all these things all at once either. There seems to be some time going on. And then he gives this word of command. Ephatha. Be opened. What I get from this, and I think we're supposed to get from this, is there was a level of difficulty to this healing that up to this point we have not seen. And in one sense, I don't really know what to make of that. We're going to take, make an attempt to understand this, but it is just important to note that. We know that Jesus has all power. Jesus is omnipotent. He says in the Bible, he created all things, and by him all things hold together. Okay. However, during his life on the earth, Jesus was functioning in his humanity as a man by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is an example for you and for me. So if you've ever been in a case with somebody where you're praying for them and it seems like it just goes on and on and it gets harder and harder, Jesus experienced that too. There are a couple stories where Jesus is healing people where Jesus seems to indicate that more was needed than usual. We talk about unusual methods, but some of these stories teach us that there's more to it than just commanding someone to be healed. In chapter 9, we're going to read about the demon-possessed boy who the disciples were unable to heal, even though they had cast out many demons at this time. And they said to Jesus, why couldn't we cast it out? He said, this kind only comes out through prayer and fasting. That there was a level of spiritual preparation that was needed for certain spiritual confrontations. In chapter 8, when Jesus spits in the guy's eyes, he's going to say, can you see now? He says, well... I see people that look like trees walking, right? He says, well, I can see, I mean, you know, you ever had a bad pair of glasses on or something? I can kind of, you know, see smudges and shapes, and I don't really know what I'm looking at here. And then Jesus laid hands on him again, and then he was able to see. that Jesus had to lay hands on this person twice. Now, it could be that there were many instances where this kind of thing had to happen. There are, there are certain healings the Bible shows us that require extra effort, and even specific petitions. And I'm trying to bring these things out because here's what we can do. We can get a picture in our mind of what healing should look like and neglect the actual details that the Bible gives us. And then we start to compare our experience to the preformed opinions in our mind rather than what the Bible demonstrates. Turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 4. It's going to be way back in the Old Testament. 2 Kings chapter 4. It comes right after 1 Kings. <laughs> I used to mess with our youth group. I'd say, turn to 2 Kings chapter 4. It comes right after 2 Kings chapter 3. And they would groan and say, that's not funny. I'd say, well, I'm laughing. But we're talking about healings that required a little extra. 2 Kings chapter 4. We're going to start at verse 29. But this is when Elisha had a family that took good care of him. He prayed for the Lord to give them a son. They had the son. At one point, the son grew sick and died. So the woman comes to Elisha and says, My son has died. <coughs> I never asked for a son in the first place. Why did you do this to me? Well, Elisha said to Gehazi, who was his servant, Elisha said, Tie up your garment, take my staff in your hand, and go. If you meet anyone, do not greet him, and if anyone greets you, do not reply. Lay my staff on the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So he arose and followed her. Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the face of the child, but there was no sound or sign of life. Therefore he returned to meet him and told him, The child has not awakened. When Elisha came into the house, he saw the child lying dead on his bed. So he went in and shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. Very private setting, right? Then he went up and lay on the child, putting his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, and his hands on his hands. And as he stretched himself upon him, the flesh of the child became warm. Then he got up again and walked once back and forth in the house and went up and stretched himself upon him. The child sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes. Pretty amazing miracle. But what I'm trying to draw out and compare for you here is Elisha's apparent difficulties in healing this child. 
Elisha performed an awful lot of miracles. I may double check me on this, but I believe other than Moses, he may have performed the most miracles in the Old Testament. When she said, my son has died, he said, take my staff and go lay it on the, on the face of the child. He clearly expected that to work. When it didn't, he arrived there, went into the room by himself, had a private time of intercession before the Lord, stretched himself out on the child and began to pray. And he had to do it a second time. This is very mysterious. And I'm trying to remind us, healing is a mysterious thing. And you should be careful when you start putting a definition of what it has to look like in your life. Because you might miss it. I think it might be significant that in 1 Corinthians 12, in both verse 9 and 28, he refers to, in his long list of the gifts of, spirit, of the Spirit, he refers to gifts of healing in the plural. He talks about the gift of teaching, the gift of ministration, the gift of tongues, the gift of interpretation. Gifts of healing. That might not mean much, but what it could imply is Paul knew from experience healing is a different thing, man. And people have different gifts and function in it in a different way. And I've never seen two people have the same gift of healing function the same way. That could be what Paul's getting at. When we approach spiritual power, there's a lot we don't understand. But what is abundantly clear from the story of Elisha, from the story we just read about Jesus, we must not, our second D, we must not become discouraged when there is no immediate answer from the Lord. Most prayer for healing is peremptory. It's quick. It's lay hands, pray, move along. Most of it is never repeated. And most people, even if this is never taught explicitly, some things are more caught than taught in church, you know. If some things that, well, I'll say it this way. If you ask for more healing than that, sometimes what is kind of understood is that you're expressing a lack of faith. We laid hands on you, prayed for you. You come back and want to get prayed again, you might get a gentle talking to from somebody saying, look, if God said no, you need to be okay with that. Or we'll say, if I were to ask again, don't ask twice, because if you do, you're demonstrating you didn't have faith the first time, and that's a lack of faith, and you'll never get anything from Jesus. Or it's just seen as a lack of spirituality. Why are you so insistent on God doing something for you? Wasn't your salvation enough? How heartless is that? How cold is that for somebody? I think we've just seen a couple examples of persistence in prayer for healing. Jesus of Nazareth had to lay hands on somebody twice. Jesus of Nazareth put his fingers in the ear and then spit and touched the tongue and then sighed unto heaven and then said, Ephatha, there was a process to it. Elisha had his staff laid on the child, nothing. Went and prayed, nothing. Stretched out on the child, little better. Stretched out on the child again, now he's healed. In 1 Kings chapter 18, when Elijah's on top of Mount Carmel, he knew that the rain was coming, but he had to go and pray seven times before he saw any evidence that God was going to answer. Even Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, the great passage all about my grace is sufficient for you, Paul says, I prayed three times. I see that not just as three, oh Lord, please help these eyes of mine. I see Paul saying, I went before the church, had the elders anoint me with oil and do the whole shebang three different times. And then the Lord told me my grace is sufficient. Which tells us, even in the passage that reminds us about God's gracious no, Paul is setting us the default example, which is to keep on coming. To be persistent. Because praying one time or even twice and not receiving an answer is not definitive evidence biblically that God has said no. It's simply not. There are too many examples of when these things actually happened that show you how complicated this is. And if we're nervous about supernatural things, sometimes we want to try to make it as clean and tidy as possible. That's not how the Bible describes it, guys. Well, then what's taken so long? Would you believe that there may be demonic opposition to what you're trying to ask for? Daniel chapter 10, verses 12 through 13. Daniel was praying for the Lord to restore the land of Israel and to reveal to him their future. Two things that God wanted to do because we know he wanted to do them, because he did them. But it took three weeks, and Daniel did not hear anything from the Lord. 21 days of fasting and prayer. That's a long time. Until finally an angel appeared to Daniel. And the angel said to me, Fear not, Daniel, 
For from the first day, three weeks ago, you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God. Your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. So he says, hey, the day you started praying, God sent me to answer your prayers. Now you go, wait a minute, three weeks, what took so long? He explains, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. But Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia. God sent an angelic messenger to answer Daniel's prayer. A demonic prince of the king of Persia fought with him and prevented him from bringing the message to Daniel. God then sent backup to the archangel Michael, who was currently holding off the armies of the prince of Persia so that the message could be given to Daniel. And then later on in that passage, he says, I must return now to fight with the princes of Persia. The battle was still going on. Daniel prayed. God immediately said, answer his prayer. But there were three weeks of spiritual warfare. Well, why doesn't God just give the answer instantly? Why does he use angels? Well, why does he use you for anything? Because he's got a plan for the angels like he's got a plan for you. And God is wise in all of his ways. What's the point? We have no idea what's happening in the heavenlies. When we begin to pray, we don't know what's happening. So how do we know if we should keep praying? Well, you've got an awful lot of commandments in the Bible to persist in asking. So many people have been dealing with problems for years. And have grown discouraged and don't want to pray about it anymore and don't want to ask for healing from the Lord anymore. Now, again, 2 Corinthians 12 tells us there are times where the Lord says no. The Lord says, no, I'm not going to heal you this time and here's why. In Paul's case, it was to keep him humble because God was showing him heaven and all kinds of crazy things. However, I do need to put this out there once again with all the love in my heart. Sometimes it is not that we have faith in God's grace to sustain us. It is that we lack faith in God's power and his character. And we don't refuse to pray out of respect for God. We refuse to pray out of fear of being disappointed again. We say things like, look, I've come to terms with my situation. I'm glad you have. You should. You should be like Job that says, God gives and God takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Naked I came to the womb and naked I'm going back. But then let me ask you this question. If you've truly come to terms with your situation, then why not keep asking? Well, I've come to terms. I don't want to pray anymore. I don't understand that. If you say, well, if I've come to terms that I'm okay with it, I don't want to be healed anymore. I don't really care what happens now. Then why not keep asking? That's the best time to keep asking because you've already dealt with your heart and you say, now I'm just coming because I really need this and I really want this and I know God loves me and he's not going to hold it against me. What it really becomes is that I'm not, I'm not trying to call anybody out in, a, in an angry way, just gently to say. Sometimes we say, well, I'm okay with the way things are because I just can't go through that again. I can't get my hopes up again. I can't be thinking that God's going to answer and then see nothing happen. That's not faith. That's a lack of faith. It's discouragement. But it's been so long, Tyler. You don't know how many times they've laid hands on me. You don't know how long I've been waiting for this. Friend, even Jesus Christ, our Lord, took extra time with a difficult case. And it seems that Jesus regarded each healing as different than the previous one. There is so much variety in the descriptions of the healing that people endured. Which, here's another lesson that somebody might need, which is why you best not judge somebody else and their testimony of healing. We, I, look, I understand that there are some crazy people out there, but do you know that God uses crazy people too? <laughs> Amen, anybody? Amen. God uses crazy people. And I never want to be the one calling out somebody else's ministry because it doesn't sit well with me. Oh, I wouldn't do it like that. Then don't do it like that. Who are you to judge another man's servant? Jesus spit in somebody's face. 
How would you feel? Oh, next down the road, somebody got healed. The pastor walked up and spit in their face. You'd say, well, that doesn't sound like the Holy Ghost to me. Really? Holy Ghost did that. This child was sick, and the preacher stretched himself out all over the child. Oh, that's not right. It's in the Bible a couple times, actually. What am I trying to say? When you're getting into the realm of healing and miracles, friends, you are outside of the realm of the flesh. And you need to start thinking according to the Spirit and not judging your brothers and sisters. There's a prophecy that Jesus was fulfilling in this passage, and I think it's very appropriate for the, the point we're making tonight. It's in Isaiah chapter 35, verses 3 through 6. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. That's what I want to do tonight. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong and fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. And the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. One of the ways you know God has come to bring salvation, according to the prophet Isaiah and the apostle Mark, is there will be healings of the body. And has there ever been a revival where that was not happening? The default attitude of the Christian is to be hope. Jesus does all things well. And tonight he wants to restore the faith of the discouraged one in this room. Hope should lead to persistent prayer for healing. That's the only point I want you to grasp tonight is to keep on asking. For Jesus himself said at the end of this book in Mark 16, these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. And we have seen it in this room, friends. We have seen it here. We have seen it among even some of you. And I'll tell you, when you start praying for people to be healed, you will be amazed at what can start to happen. Remarkable things. The Bible instructs us to seek and to expect healing from the hands of Jesus by the Holy Spirit. If you doubt that, go back and read James 5 again. But we face, number one, doubts about whether or not God would want to heal us. And number two, discouragement when it seems like we asked and he didn't answer. And those things prevent us from being obedient and asking again. Tonight, what we've seen is that God's love for you is overwhelming. He's brought you into his family. You're not a dog at the table. You're a child. You're a son or a daughter of the king. And not only that, but every healing is different. And you should not compare yours to somebody else. You should just keep on coming to Jesus and asking him. The answer in every case is persistence in prayer, like the Syrophoenician woman showed in seeking healing for her daughter, and as Jesus himself showed in his own ministry. It is of course true, God can sometimes say no, but we are in certain terms to assail heaven and ask. You never know when the breakthrough is going to happen, so don't give up and keep seeking your healing.